Hi, and welcome to this video. I am Victor Gijspers, and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Today I want to talk about an article, uh, I think it was originally a speech, by Elizabeth Anscom called Causality and Determination. I'll be using the version of the speech or article that appears in Causation, edited by Ernest Souza and Michael Tooley, uh, but this article has been anthologized more widely, uh, as well as being available, I think, in several places on the internet. Causality and Determination is an article about, unsurprisingly, causality and determination. Anscom is going to ask us what the relation between those two is. She's going to wonder whether causality implies determination, whether a causal relation is a relation of determination, what causation has to do with necessity and with universal application, um, and what the relation between determinism and determination is. It's not a very long article, but a lot is happening in it, uh, and I think it is extremely interesting. So let's look at the text. Here is how Enscom starts off. It is often declared or evidently assumed that causality is some kind of necessary connection, or alternatively, that being caused is non-trivially instancing some exceptionless generalization, saying that such an event always follows such antecedents, or the two conceptions are combined. So Anscombe is here putting forward uh, two very famous ideas about causation. One is that causation has to do with a necessary connection. That's a phrase that, that is well known, for instance, from David Hume. And so the idea would be that A causes B means A makes B necessary. Right? Once you have A, it can't be otherwise than that you will also have B. Right? So that's one way of thinking about causation. And here's another way of thinking about causation, which is not quite the same, although we can also find this in David Hume, uh, which is the idea that, that a causal statement is actually a statement about the instantiation of some universal regularity. So when I say that A causes B, I am saying that all A's are followed by B's. Right? So that's a general claim. All A's are followed by B's. And you can also combine these two things, right? You could say that a causal statement claims that there is a universal generalization because A's necessitate B's, right? That, that's an easy combination that, in fact, a lot of philosophers uh, might embrace. Now, Enscombe goes on to point out that there are many, many different theories that you can build from these assumptions including, uh, on at least one interpretation of Hume, a kind of skeptical reading, according to which we can't even know whether there is any causation, or readings which, you know, have different ideas about what general truths are, or what these necessary connections are, and so on and so forth. But all of these theories, Anscombe says, have one thing in common. What they have in common is the following assumption. If an effect occurs in one case, and a similar effect does not occur in another apparently similar case, there must be a relevant further difference. So the idea is that if, if different things happen in two cases which seem to be alike, there must be some difference that accounts for the change in what happens, that accounts for the difference in what happens. So if A is followed by B in one case, and A is followed by C in another case, then there must be some extra thing, let's say some D, um, that is present in one case but not the other and that influences the outcome. In other words, what this assumption denies is it denies the possibility that really similar cases, cases with no difference, could end up leading to a different result. Right? That is being denied here. So what is being denied here is that something could, in a sense, just happen, right? Maybe it was caused, but it wasn't like necessary that it happened in precisely this way or precisely that way, right? What is being denied here is a kind of leeway or, or openness or, or a contingency in nature. Anscombe is going to um, try to persuade us that we shouldn't 
simply accept this assumption. That maybe we have good reasons not to accept this assumption. That at the very least, we should take denying this assumption very, very seriously. Uh, in fact, she goes on to say that the truth of this conception is hardly debated. It is indeed a bit of Weltanschauung. It helps to form a cast of mind which is characteristic of our whole culture. Um, well, I would love to hear more about that, right? How is it characteristic of our whole culture? Enscom doesn't say much about that, although she will say something about how this way of thinking developed um, from Newtonianism and especially Newtonian astronomy in the second part of this paper. So, in the first pages of Causality and Determination, Anscom is going to run by some of these famous philosophers who said something about causation. So we get Aristotle and we get Spinoza and we get Hobbes, and all of them seem to think of causation as in a sense a kind of logical relation, right? If, if A happens, then B has to happen because it would be a contradiction for A to happen and B not to happen. Okay, but then David Hume bursts onto the scene um, and David Hume argues that that is not a, the right way of thinking, right? That it's always conceivable, um, which certainly implies for Hume that it's always logically possible for A to happen and B not to happen, right? It, we can always think of any circumstance being followed by any other circumstance. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be a sort of logical contradiction in, in any scenario of A following B whatever those two events are. So, Hume denies this, and he is very influential in that. Um, and the discovery, Anscombe says with some irony, was thought to be great. But as touching the equation of causality with necessitation, Hume's thinking did nothing against this, but curiously reinforced it. For he himself assumed that necessary connection is an essential part of the idea of the relation of cause and effect, and he sought for its nature. So insofar as it would be right to, to think of Hume as, as a kind of a causal skeptic, and I'm not gonna try to decide that question here, it's, it's a question that is very much debated in, uh, in Hume's studies, uh, but insofar as it is correct to think of Hume as somebody who is kind of skeptical about causal relations, um, that is because he accepts the assumption that causation has to be necessary connection and because he thinks that it's really hard to find or even conceive of necessary connections. All right, so that is sort of the introduction, right? Sort of the, 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 the historical background, at least for now. Later on, uh, Anscombe is going to bring in Newton and explain why this idea has become so dominant, especially certain ideas about determinism, but we will get to that in the in the second part of the paper. Uh, now, Enscombe is going to argue that at least at first sight, this assumption is dubious, right? That when we really think about what we mean about causation, what we mean when we talk about causation, um, it's not necessary connection. It's not that the cause makes the effect necessary. So here is, here is Anscombe, and I'm a little bit later on, like after she has gone through Hume and Kant and Russell, uh, Mill. Here's what she writes. She says, Now it's not difficult to show it prima facie wrong to associate the notion of cause with necessity or universality in this way. For it being much easier to trace effects back to causes with certainty than to predict effects from causes, we often know a cause without knowing whether there is an exceptionless generalization or whether there is a necessity. So here is, here is the example that Anscombe gives us. Suppose that I come down with a particular infectious disease. How did I get that disease? Well, you know, a week ago, I made a visit to somebody who was ill because that person had this same disease and I spent the entire day by their bedside. Yeah, okay, it was that, right? It was being in contact with that person that has made me ill. We can be, I mean, it's not 100% certain, but we can be pretty confident of that, right? That is very, very probably the cause 
of me having the disease. Okay. Does that mean that there is some exceptionless generalization that goes like this? Every time you spend a day sitting next to somebody who has this disease, you will get the disease. Well, no, right? Absolutely not. Very often, maybe somebody will sit for an entire day next to somebody with this disease and not become ill themselves. Um, nobody maybe could really predict whether I would get ill, right? So there, it doesn't seem to be the case that there is a, an exceptionless generalization here. And it also doesn't seem to be the case that there is a necessary connection that being next to this person necessarily leads to being ill. So neither the exceptionless generalization nor the uh, necessary connection seem to be in place here. And yet we have absolutely no problem in talking about cause and effect here, right? We have absolutely no problem in saying that it was very probably being next to this person that caused me to become ill. So at least at first sight, Enscombe tells us, at least at first sight, it seems that, you know, when we talk about causation, we are not talking about necessity and we're not talking about universal generalization. Then what are we talking about? Well, Anscombe says, there is something to observe here that lies under our noses. It is little attended to and yet still so obvious as to seem trite. It is this. Causality consists in the derivativeness of an effect from its causes. This is the core, the common feature of causality in its various kinds. Effects derive from, arise out of, come off their causes, right? My illness came from that other person, right? And being in contact with that other person, it derived from that. But that's a statement about what happened in this individual instance, right? And it doesn't seem to say anything about necessity or anything about generality. And so Anscombe says, causation is not to be identified with necessitation. If A comes from B, this does not imply that every A-like thing comes from some B-like thing, uh, or that every B-like thing has an A-like thing coming from it, or, or that given A, there had to be a B for it to come from, and so on and so forth, right? I mean, there's none of that is implied in the idea of one thing coming from something else. Okay, now Enscombe is going to think about a particular way of reacting to this the Humean way of reacting to this, which like would be the way of David Hume maybe, but also the way of a lot of 20th and 21st century philosophers who have been very much influenced by Hume. Right? Humean ways of thinking about causation are still very much alive. Um, they are as alive now, I would say, in 2021 as they were in 1971, 50 years ago, when Enscombe published this article. So the influential Humean argument at this point is that we can't similarly observe causality in the individual case. So that is, this is supposed to be somehow problematic, right? How could we have, um, how could we claim that in this individual case, A caused B, when we cannot observe causality in the individual case, right? All we can observe are these large patterns. And so the Humean might say, when we talk about causation, we must actually be talking about those large patterns. We must be talking about universal generalizations because that's the only thing we can observe. Anscombe is going to have none of that. And she's gonna make two numbered points, first and second. Um, and first is she's gonna talk about the statement that we can never observe causality in the individual case. And as a sort of methodological remark, she says, you know, whenever somebody says that you can't observe something, you're going to find that they will think about what it is to observe that thing in such a way that it indeed becomes impossible. So here's another example. Suppose that somebody says that you can't observe people thinking. And I say, well, sure, I can observe people thinking. Look, I just gave that student a difficult math problem. I can see them thinking now. And in a minute or so, they'll come up with the answer. And then they come up with the answer. And I say, look, we just observed somebody thinking. 
And of course, the original person is going to say, no, 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 we didn't observe them thinking. We observed some outward behavior, but we couldn't really see the thoughts. Okay. Um, it's unclear whether that's an important philosophical discovery, right? I mean, yes, there is a way of thinking about observing thinking in which it is impossible to observe thinking, but is that the important or salient way of thinking about that? Okay, that's what, what Anscombe is asking here too. Surely there are ways of thinking about observing causation in a sense in which we cannot observe causation. Right? And, and Hume sort of, if Hume says, well, where is it, the necessary connection? Like, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, okay, it, it's not, you can't see the necessary connection as some, some sort of extra thing in our perception. That doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, and now Anscombe, I think, is, is in this paragraph, uh, uh, you know, getting kind of close to, to later Wittgenstein, uh, who she studied with, uh, and talking about, you know, how we talk about this kind of stuff. We, we describe the world, when we look at the world, in all kinds of evidently causal terms, right? Here are some examples. Scrape, push, wet, carry, eat, burn, knock over. Um, if I say, wow, I just saw that person knock over that other person, that's what I saw. Well, then I'm claiming I saw something causal, right? I mean, that one person knocking over the other person, that's a causal claim. That's a claim about one thing leading to something else. It was this one person pushing that led to the other person falling. Um, and so Enscombe says, well, as surely as we learned to call people by name or to report from seeing it that the cat was on the table, we also learned to report from having observed it that someone drank up the milk, right? That's a causal thing. Uh, or that the dog made a funny noise. That's a causal claim that it was the dog that caused this sound, uh, or that things were cut or broken by whatever we saw cut or break them. Uh, and so Enscombe is suggesting here that, at least in a very everyday sense, we definitely do observe causation. She's not making any sort of big, big claim about like whether causation really is observable or not, right? She's, I think, more sort of weakening the appeal of the Humean claim that we can't observe it. Um, and then there is this parenthetical remark where she says, yeah, the Humean is actually sort of taking a, a Cartesian line here uh, by sort of, you know, pointing out that we can never be certain that there was causation. And that's true, but that's true about almost everything we observe. Right, I think I observe a, a, I mean, a pencil here. Right, this seems to be a pencil. Now, I guess somebody could have taken a, uh, I don't know, what could this be? A uh, cunningly disguised piece of plastic in pencil form. And as soon as I start to write with it, it turns out that you can't write with it because it's plastic and it doesn't contain whatever it is that you call the inside of a pencil in English. Lead? Well, it's not lead, but somehow that, that pop, I mean, it's carbon, but. Um, okay, graphite? Well, okay, this is not important. Uh, you know, so, so this Cartesian tack that we can't be certain doesn't seem to be very important, but uh, I mean, it doesn't seem to be very efficient. We can, we can still quite reasonably claim that we can actually observe all kinds of causal relations. Second, the second point that Anscombe is going to make is that, well, you know, when it comes to, to universal generalizations that the Humean says we are actually talking about when we talk about causation, Anscombe again with uh, probably a typical British understatement says, the needed examples are none too common in fact, the needed examples aren't common at all, right? We talk about causation in many, many instances, but there are few, perhaps almost no, perhaps no instances in which we are able to give an exceptionless universal generalization. Um, always given A, B follows. It's really hard to come up with any non-trivial A and B for which that is true. 
Right? Always when you throw a paper into the fire, it will burn to ashes. Well, no. Not if somebody quickly grabs it out, or if somebody pours a bucket of water over the paper, or if the paper has been, I don't know, impregnated with a certain substance that, you know, doesn't burn, or well, I don't know. I mean, there are endless ways in which, in which this could fail to happen. And yet, when we do throw some papers into the fire and they burn to ashes, we have no trouble saying that it was the fire that caused the paper to turn to ash. So these universal generalizations just don't really seem to be available. Um, and Anscombe says, well, you know, there is, I suppose, a vague association in people's minds between the universal propositions, which would be examples of the required type of generalizations, and scientific laws. But there is no similarity. Scientific laws do not have to form a always follows B, unless C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, R. You know, that's, that's not the form that scientific laws have. And then um, Anscombe tells us something about having, you know, the need for normal conditions. Like, and we, when I say something like um, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, yeah, you know, in normal circumstances. And normal circumstances means that it has to be at a particular pressure and it has to be like pure water and it has to be, um, you know, not, 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 I guess, heavy water. Uh, I suppose that might have a very different boiling point. Uh, and who knows how many other, how many other things I would have to, to sort of add to that which we're never going to find in a scientific law, right? I mean, a, a scientific law might be something like PV is NKT or something like that. Um, it doesn't have the form of A are always followed, but A's are always followed by B's. All right, so that is what Anscombe wants to tell us about the relation between causation, causality, as she calls it, and necessity or, or universal validity. And she seems to have done a pretty good job and at least opening up the possibility that these are not the same concepts, right? I mean, none of this is like a knockdown argument, uh, but I think she's mostly concerned with showing that there is a wide open field for thinking and theorizing here that because we were sort of locked into one way of thinking, we didn't even see. So section two, section two is going to bring in some science and it's going to bring in different kinds of scientific systems, especially um, Anscombe is going to talk about Newtonian mechanics and quantum mechanics, one being famously a deterministic um, system. There's actually some questions about that, but let's assume for purposes of reading this paper that it is a deterministic system. Uh, and quantum mechanics, which is famously supposed to be an indeterministic theory. And so Anscombe is going to, to wonder about the status of those kinds of theories and whether they should lead us to believe in determinism and whether that should lead us to believe that every course of action has in fact been necessitated, right? Whether it is in fact true that anything that happens was necessary, which, you know, would seem to offer some much needed um, consolation to the assumption made at the beginning of the paper, the assumption that uh, that Anscombe wants to deny. I mean, if everything is determined, if everything is necessary, then it makes some sense to think of causation as you know our search for the, our search for causation as our search for this necessary connection. Now, Anscombe is going to argue that both with deterministic and with indeterministic scientific theories, there is no reason to believe in determinism. And therefore, there's no reason to believe that any event has to be necessitated, uh, that any event is, in fact, necessary. So Anscombe starts section two of the paper by bringing in this example of the Galton board, right? Maybe the first description of it doesn't make so much sense, but it's like sort of this, this triangle of little pins, and then you throw lots and lots of balls from the top and they sort of go every which way. And most of them end up falling in the middle, but some of them end up, you know, near the edges and you get this like nice, nice curve. Um, so 
here's what she wonders. Like, let's take one ball. Was it determined? Was it necessary that it ended up falling in this particular place? And she says, we would probably all have said it was in the time when Newton's mechanics was undisputed for truth. It was the impression made on Hume and later philosophers by that mechanics that gave them so strong a conviction of the eye and necessity with which everything happens. The absolute fate by which every object is determined to a certain degree and direction of its motion. Yet, and here Anscombe's sort of um, alternative way of thinking comes to, to the fore, yet no one could have deduced the resting place of the ball because of the indeterminateness that you get even in the Newtonian mechanics arising from the finite accuracy of measurement. Right, I mean, even the most, the smallest difference in the starting position or velocity or weight or whatever of the ball um, is going to make a major uh, difference on where it ends up at the bottom. And she goes on to say that, you know, if you, if you think about the kind of smallness of the error that you, that you would have, like how accurately you would have to measure in order to use Newtonian mechanics to predict where any individual ball is gonna end up, she says, it would be a figure of such smallness as to have no meaning as a figure for a margin of error. However, so long as you believed the classical mechanics, you might also think that there could be no such thing as a figure for a difference that had no meaning. Then you would think that though it was not feasible for us to find the necessary path of the ball, because our margins of error are too great, yet there was a necessary path. Okay, so here is a way of thinking that Anscombe thinks is kind of natural, but which she is not endorsing and which in fact the rest of the article is going to combat. It's the idea that even though we might not be able to make predictions, um, nevertheless, there is this necessary path. There is this predetermined path. Well, she's not going to prove that that's false, but she is going to prove, or she's going to argue at least, uh, that we don't really have any reason to believe that. Because why would we believe it? Well, and I'm, I'm sort of moving forward without actually moving forward, so I'm sort of skipping ahead to something that Anscombe is going to say a couple of pages later on. Here is one reason why you might think that. You might be really impressed by a particular application of Newton's theory, right? And that particular application would be the solar system. So here we have the solar system. We measure the positions of the planets. We measure the velocities of the planets. Um, we sort of infer the masses of the planets and then we start calculating. And it is beautiful, right? It works. We are completely able, for instance, to predict when the next solar eclipse will be. And with incredible precision, right? We know exactly when. We know exactly where. We know exactly when, what planet will appear at what position in the sky. Wow. So what this does is it forges in our minds the idea, a connection between having a deterministic theory like Newton's mechanics and being able to predict perfectly everything that will happen. And so it also forges in our minds the idea that if it comes to something like the Galton board, okay, we are not able to make all the measurements and calculations with the, with the accuracy that we would need. But at bottom, it must be just like the solar system, right? If we could do it, if we were not as limited as we were, then we would have the same kind of success that we have had with the solar system. Okay, Anscombe says, that's a nice idea, but the fact that the solar system has been such, and here I, uh, I am going to quote, this gave the impression that we had here an ideal scientific explanation. 
Whereas the truth was, it was mere obligingness on the part of the solar system, by having had so peaceful a history in recorded time, to provide such a model. For suppose that some planet had at some time erupted with such violence that its shell was propelled rocket-like out of the solar system. Such an event would not have violated Newton's laws. On the contrary, it would have illustrated them. But also it would not have been calculable, as the past and future motions of the planets are presently calculated, on the assumption that they can be treated as the simple bodies of his mechanics, with no relevant properties but mass, position and velocity, and no forces mattering except gravity. When we actually apply a scientific theory, we are going to make all kinds of idealizations. Right? When we are going, going to apply Newtonian mechanics to the solar system, we are going to assume that these are just point masses, and that everything that's going to happen is just the gravitational pull between these point masses, and that's it. There are innumerable events that would falsify those assumptions. A planet exploding, the sun going nova, a gigantic meteor coming from outer space and obliterating the Earth. Um, you know, all of that is possible. All of that is possible. And none of it would be predicted by somebody using the Newtonian astronomical, astronomical model. So our assumption that if you have a deterministic theory and you apply it, then you get the right answers, then you are able to perfectly predict what happens. The assumption that that is the normal situation and that the abnormal situation in a sense is the one in which unfortunately we don't have all the info we need, but you know, if we had it, we would be back at the normal situation. That assumption according to Anscombe is totally false. Right? The reality is that we are always working with a very limited model. Right? We are always working with uh, a whole bunch of assumptions uh, on the idea that you know nothing is going to interfere. There's not going to be anything unexpected going on. But there's always the possibility of something unexpected. Right? And that possibility doesn't, it doesn't even imply that the laws of nature are false. It just implies that they couldn't be like applied in this particular situation in the way that we were trying to apply them in order to get this perfect prediction. So the story that Anscombe is telling is a story in which scientific theories, in which the application of scientific theories is inherently and necessarily sort of messy and provisional, right? You make assumptions, you hope that nothing strange happens that doesn't fit your assumptions, and you must be aware of the possibility always of some external influence, of something happening um, that you didn't account for, that throws your, your predictions uh, out of whack. Or, you know, maybe there are all kinds of different you know, forces and things going on in your system, each of which has a nice scientific theory, but which you just can't combine in such a way that there's going to be one perfect prediction coming out of the system. That too would seem to be quite possible. So Anscombe is basically suggesting to us that we don't have any reason, even if our best scientific theories are deterministic, we don't have any reason to believe that everything in the world is determined. Right? And so we don't have any reason to believe that any event in the world happens of necessity. And that is even true if we think just about Newtonian mechanics, which is deterministic. Uh, and so it's even easier to see this if we take an indeterministic theory like quantum mechanics, which tells us that some things happen just by chance, right? And actually could have gone differently. And against the people who would say that quantum mechanics is just about very small scales, uh, so it doesn't really affect anything that happens at a large scale. Anscombe uses this Feynman example of the of this this sort of bomb, right? I can make a bomb with a Geiger counter, and it sort of counts. We put it next to some radioactive material, and let's say that there's a 50% chance that the radioactive material will send out 10 radioactive particles in the next hour, and if it does so, then the bomb will explode. 
And if it doesn't do so, then the bomb won't explode. And so there is a sort of 50% chance of the bomb exploding and a 50% chance of the bomb not exploding, um, which is, you know, gonna make a major difference maybe to what happens in the world, even though it's based on this indeterminism at a very, very small scale. So if we have that, then things are even worse for those who believe that everything is determined, of course. So, Enscombe actually, you know, she is careful to emphasize that she thinks that her argument goes through even for Newtonianism, uh, but it might be easier for people to understand it and to learn the lessons when they are well aware of, um, of the indeterminism of our fundamental physical theories. Let's take a few final minutes to look at what Anscombe has to say about free will at the very end of the paper. So this is the very end of the paper and she says, it was natural that when physics went indeterministic, some thinkers should have seized on this indeterminism as being just what was wanted for defending the freedom of the will. Uh, and Anscombe is actually sympathetic to this idea, sympathetic to the idea that if we are free, if we can really choose one thing or another thing, then there ought to be some kind of indeterminism in the world, right? It ought to be the case that two different things can happen. I can do this or I can do that. So um, in the discussion, as it's known among philosophers, between compatibilism, which says that free will is compatible with determinism, and incompatibilism, which says that free will is not compatible with determinism, uh, Anscombe seems to be on the incompatibilist side here. So they received severe criticism on two counts. One, that this mere hap is the very last thing to be invoked as the physical correlate of man's ethical behavior. The other, that quantum laws predict statistics of events when situations are repeated. Interference with these by the wills determining individual events which the laws of nature leave undetermined would be as much a violation of natural law as would have been interference with which falsified a deterministic mechanical law. Um, so let's look at the first one first. That's the easiest to understand. It basically says that, you know, random quantum events in your brain, well, if, if that's what determines your behavior, then you're not very free. You're just very random. Yeah, sure. But nobody says that this is the, the full story about freedom, right? Uh, if you're an incompatibilist, you would say that we need randomness, like we need indeterminism. That's what I should say. We need indeterminism um, in the world in order to have freedom. But of course, I mean, in order to, to have freedom, we need more, right? We need ideas or reasons or, or something like that, choices, right? Something that makes it a choice. Um, and that's not something that we find in quantum mechanics, but you know, that's not necessarily a problem. That's uh, well, the other thing that we need is going to come from somewhere else, right? It's going to come from reason or something like that. Okay, so, so Anscombe sort of dismisses this. The other objection, she says, is more to the point, right? So this objection is that if you have a deterministic theory, then free will that changes what happens violates the laws of nature because it makes something happen that is not allowed by the deterministic system. And of course, that's not true in an indeterministic system. But, you know, suppose that there is a situation in which it is indeterministic whether I raise my left or my right hand with a 50-50% chance. And now I decide to always raise my right hand and never my left hand. And I keep doing this for a while. Right, then this law of nature, which says that there is actually a 50% chance that I'm gonna raise my left hand. This is a pretty tiresome video to make. Um, that there is a 50% chance that I'm raising my left hand. That law of nature is being falsified, or at least it becomes more and more improbable. Well, Anscombe says that would be true if we had to think of what, ha what the laws of nature describe as being linked up with my behavior in such a simple way, right? Like this little event in the brain is raising my left hand and that other little event in the brain is raising my right hand and the laws of nature tell us that it's 50-50. But actually we can have the sort of complete like statistical randomness and yet 
an obvious pattern of behavior. And so it could be the case that everything in my head happens with pure quantum randomness, and yet I always raise my right hand. And Anscom has a marvelous analogy for this. Uh, she says, you know, suppose that there's this colored gas flying around in a box, and it's pure statistics, right? It's, 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 you know, all these things are just moving exactly as you might expect them to move, um, given the law of physics, and, and you know, it's, 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 all, it's all perfectly all right, given statistical mechanics, but nevertheless, the colored gas always forms the word Coca-Cola. It's not clear that this would violate any law of nature. Um, could be right, could be right. I mean, I think this is a very difficult question um, that you could only really judge by delving deeply into the notion of entropy, probably. Um, so it would require a lot of philosophy of statistical mechanics. But at the very least, I think Anscombe succeeds in showing that there is no easy argument here against free will and incompatibilism. So, how do we end the article? Well, by reading the final sentence. The most well, let me let me read slightly more than the final uh, than the final sentence. In non-experimental philosophy, it is clear enough what are the dogmatic slumbers of the day. It is over and over again assumed that any singular causal proposition implies a universal statement running always when this, then that. Often assumed that true singular causal statements are derived from such inductively believed universalities. Right, and the entire article has been trying to deny this, trying to show that we don't have a good reason to believe this, that maybe we should think about causation um, and determination in different ways. Such a thesis, the thesis that Anscombe wants to deny, needs some reason for believing it. Regularities in nature, that is not a reason. The most neglected of the key topics in this subject are interference and prevention. So interference and prevention, those are the ways in which a, a, a sort of regularity can fail to obtain. Right? Every time that I throw paper into the fire, it burns to ashes. Well, yes, unless somebody interferes or prevents um, this from happening, which is always a possibility. Now, I think Anscombe's paper has been very influential. Um, at the very least, the ideas that Anscombe is suggesting here have been taken up by, by some major philosophers of science. Uh, and I, I would say that the name that really pops out for me at the moment uh, would be Nancy Cartwright, who has done a lot of work on arguing that the laws of nature don't work the way that they were traditionally thought to work. They're not these exceptionless regularities. Applying them is messy, and we really need to think about things like prevention and interference. And so uh, Anscombe's words have certainly not fallen onto deaf ears. Well, thank you, and I hope to see you again talking about some more philosophy.